Well, good morning, everyone. Um, he has got an incredible resume of TV appearances, uh, especially in the genres that we know and love, ranging from uh, X Files to Stargate um, to Charmed, Beauty and the Beast, Murder She Wrote, NYPD. He's done movies, Hills Have Eyes Part Two, Terminator Three, Rise of the Machines, and as I was mentioning last time at opening ceremonies, my personal favorite, Doctor. So please welcome Jay Akavone to Star Basin. Hi everybody, how's it going? How's it going? How was that party last night? Everyone went to the party last night. I feel better, I threw up, and everything's better now. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. Uh, I just, uh, I drank some beer last night. I guess this doesn't connect at all. So I'll just sit in here. So how you all doing? Are you all from, like, Indiana area? Not at all. They have a lot of travelers. I traveled. I came in from uh, Tennessee, and that was, uh, I thought it was cold there, and then I came here. And then I learned, I learned what real cold is. Because I'm from California, you know, we're, we're sissies out there. We like warm weather. So anyway, who's got a question for me? Absolutely no one. Okay, I can see this is... Warm up a bit. Warm you up a bit. Come here, we can cuddle. <laughs> Okay, talk about myself. Gee, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's something I I I, uh, I love doing. Uh, let me see. Well, uh, let me let me just say that uh, the last couple of weeks, or uh, last couple of months rather, I've really kind of gotten back into it, and and I just did an episode of um, uh, a show called Prime Suspect with Maria Bello, which unfortunately now is going off the air. But from what I hear, they're going to air my episode before they actually take the show off the air. And before that, I did an episode of How I Met Your Mother, and I had uh, I had fun on both of them. It was uh, it was great. And other than that, I've been doing just construction, and, and uh, things have been good for me. Uh, my life is now straightened out, um, and uh, I, I live with a girl out in California, and I'm having a great time. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's, uh, are, are you warm enough now? <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. That's what I, well, about five years ago, I really found that I couldn't really depend on uh, um, uh, show business anymore to make a living and, and make a decent living at it. So I knew how to build stuff. I always did. And I always had, you know, a million dollars worth of tools at my house that my wife, my ex-wife used to yell at me about all the time. So I went to work and, and uh, I really enjoy construction. I specialize in certain things. I build uh, garages, carports, uh, things like that. And, and yeah, so that's that's really primarily how I'm making money. Go ahead. Yes. Are you dealing with because there's not a lot of going Yeah, no, there's not a lot of like there's not a lot of custom homes being built right now or anything like that. But uh, so so yeah, I guess I feel it. I mean, everybody feels it, and you have, you always have to drop your price to be competitive, so you can actually get jobs. So uh, it's like anything else. But it, um, I'm working. I'm working, and I feel good about it. So. Who's got a question? Hi. What was your favorite series? You said it's so many things. Yeah. Um, I always liked working for David Milch. Dave, David Milch is a great N NYPD Blue. Uh, that anything with Milch involved in it, because I, I always loved his writing, and I think he's a brilliant writer. But uh, uh, in television, uh, Milch I, and and Ron Coslow. I really enjoyed Beauty and the Beast, and, and uh, I, you know I try to have a good time wherever I go. You know and. Uh, as I was being introduced, somebody uh, uh, he, he, he said uh, he was in Charmed, and I thought I'd forgotten I did Charmed. And I said, "Yes, yes, I did do Charm. Yes, I did." And his own personal favorite, Doctor Mordred. Oh my goodness, uh, that was a full moon entertainment production, and um, it was God, it was a long time ago. Anyway. Well, Linda, Linda didn't want to do the show anymore. So they, you know, they killed her off, and then and then they hired they hired the other girl. It was a good show, and I really had a good time doing it. We all did, and uh, Ron Perlman's a gas to work with, and so is Linda Hamilton and Joe Anderson. Everybody, Ron Dutrice, they were all really really nice people to work with, and we had great directors and wonderful writing. And 
I, I'm just sorry that it only lasted three seasons. I'm sorry it didn't go on a lot longer than that. So, yeah. Hi. Well, it's the truth. I mean, if you read the if you read the bio, could I have that uh, stool right there, please? If you read the bio, there you know the magazine they're giving out with my picture in it and everybody else's picture in it. Thank you very much. And, and it it says it, it it says in there basically that, that that's a true story. I was uh, I was um, I was pumping gas at a gas station and I was out of high school probably a year and a half, two years, and uh, uh, a young guy uh, stopped by. That I had gone to school with, and I said, John Miller's name was, and I said, Hey, how you doing? And he said, well, And he used to play the guitar and sing, and he was pretty good at it. And I said, What's going on? And he said, Well, I'm, you know, I'm playing the guitar and singing, and I'm doing this club and that club and this club, all in our area. He said, and I'm doing a play down in Yorktown Heights, which was the next town south west of us. And I said, A play? And he says, Yeah, I'm doing this play called Mr. Robertson. Blah, 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 and we're going to open in about five weeks, and, you know, they're still casting some of it. He said, hey, you know, you should come down and read for it. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, read for the director and, like, get a part in it. I said, yeah, no, I don't think so. I, you know, this is what I do. I'm pumping gas and, you know, I'm painting houses, and that's what I do. Well, anyway, I went down. After, like, several phone calls, he called me the next day and the next day. And I went down and I met with the director and I got the part and I just, I really enjoyed it. I had a good time working with all the players on stage and there were a lot of laughs involved. And of course there's always beer and wine afterward and that's fun too. And so I thought, well maybe, you know, if I could make a living doing this, this could be cool. So then that fall, then that fall I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and that's when I started my education in, in, in acting and drama. And then uh, it all came together in the summer yeah, summer of 79, I, uh, I, I, I co-starred in a movie with Al Pacino called Cruising, and that really kind of, that got me in the Screen Actors Guild, that kind of broke the ice for me and got me into the business, and, and that's how I started. Yeah, and I just, uh, I don't want to say I worked all the time, but I worked a lot. I worked a lot. I worked more than most, and so I was very fortunate for a long, long time. And then, you know. And then you get old, and then you know your hair turns gray. You get a little pot belly, and they go. <laughs> You're very welcome. Hi. Al Pacino's a great guy. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a long, long time. I haven't seen Al in years, but he's a really good guy. And you know, I you know I was just a kid. I was uh, 22 years old when I worked with him, and he he you know he took. He took time with, with young guys and, and young girls and, you know, explained uh, uh, things and, and uh, his thought process. And, and he was very sharing and very giving as, a, as an actor. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yes? I, I, how did I get my role working in Stargate? Well, I read for it. I mean, I, I just went in. Uh, what happened was Mary Jo Slater was the casting director on the show at that time. And, uh, and she called me in, and I was never a great big sci-fi fan. I just, I just uh, you know, I didn't know much about sci-fi. And, and uh, so I went in, and uh, I was having trouble with the dialogue and, and believing. I always had trouble believing uh, sci-fi when I read it, you know. And there's those few sci-fi films that I really enjoy, and I think they're like Blade Runner, I, you know, and those are really cool. And I went in and read, I, I, I read the script, and then I called my acting coach right away, Howard Fine, and I said, you know, I'm really having a hard time uh, connecting with this, and I really want to do well. And he said, the whole trick with sci-fi, that when you're reading for it, and when you're, when you're playing in it, is you have to believe it yourself 100%. And if you don't believe it yourself, nobody else is ever going to believe it. So you have to just sink yourself into this and really make this your world. And so that's what I did, and I went in and I did a really nice job, uh, and, uh, and I ended up with the role, and, uh, and, and I did the pilot, and then the first episode. And you did. It was a terrific performance in the night, That would be great. Was that with the glowing eyes? Was that, are you talking about on the stretcher with the glowing eyes? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Now, I had a good time with all of it. That was... Um, Mario as a party directed the, 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 the pilot episode, and then the first episode was directed by a French guy named Dan, Dan or Dave something. 
I, I, can't, I don't remember his name. It was a long time ago. And um, I had a great time. I, but I, and I was just with the executive producer of the show recently. Uh, and I told him I, I, I always considered that first episode after the pilot uh, one, of my, one of my best episodes that I've ever done of any television show. Because, uh, you know, I just really enjoyed it. I had a great time. And, I, and when, when it was done, I, I saw it and watched it and thought, hey, you know what, this is pretty good. And, you know, it's not very often that gets to happen, at least not for me, because most of the stuff I'm in, I just go, oh, God. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi. Do you have an idea for a new science fiction series that you would like to be If I had an idea for a new science fiction, a new science fiction idea for me, for me, um, I have no idea, but it would have to, it would have to be, it, Well, Blade Runner is like my, Blade Runner and Alien are my two favorite sci-fi films. I love those movies. And, and, and Aliens as well. Um, and there were other, you know, James Cameron did a film called The Abyss, which I really enjoy. And, you know, there's, there's a number of sci-fi things that I really like. Anyway, um, if I was to come up with something, I don't know, it would probably be something where we, as humans, leave this earth and then we somehow control the thought patterns of people on Earth to, to, to keep world peace. I think that would be like a cool, a cool concept, but, you know, because it seems we can't do it ourselves down here. Yeah, we just can't seem to get it done down here. So anyway, hi. I don't understand reality. I mean, you know, it's For those of you, I'll just repeat the questions because those of you in the back maybe can't hear, but she doesn't understand reality TV. Well, join the club. Uh, neither do I. It's like, it's not really, it's, you know, to me, television is entertainment. Entertainment is scripted television. It should be written, you know, it's three-dimensional. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And at the end, we go, oh, or we go, oh. You know, it's, there, there's something, there's an emotion that you're supposed to feel when, when you say, okay, I know what we're going to do. We're going to get nine people that don't like each other very much, put them in a the house and put the cameras on and see what happens. It's not a, it's, that's a train wreck. That's a train wreck. It's family. It's exactly right. It's family. You know. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yep. So, and, and, and a lot of people in my position, a lot of people in my position, uh, meaning actors, uh, uh, in my age group and younger and older, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we all don't care for uh, reality television very much. It takes up too much space. It takes up too much time, space, and energy. I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, well, of course they do. Yeah, well, that's the, you, but you see, that's the whole object. They want to be famous for, for doing absolutely nothing. They want to be, you know, no offense, but they, wanna, they all want to be Paris Hilton, you know. And there's, you know, there's only one. So, so, and yeah, well, there you go, there you go, and it's that you know that Andy Warhol thing that everybody has to have their fifteen minutes. Uh, Prime Suspect, Prime Suspect with Maria Bella. Yeah, it is a good show. Well, it's a scripted one-hour television show about police officers. Yeah, it's a decent show. It's not, you know, it's 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 not reality television. a lot more to put it on. There's a lot more people to pay. And that's the other thing with reality television. You don't have to pay anybody anything. These people aren't in unions, so you pay them, you know, and... No, 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 no. They're very, very rarely are they actors. No, they're just people they find. I, I don't, I, I think, I think in some cases that, that might be true. I think in some cases you might be absolutely right, but they'd have to join after. American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, uh, which is very inexpensive to join, considering what the other costs of other unions are, and uh, and that's it. And they're, then they're on television. And thank you very much. And it, it, yeah, and and it's I don't know whether it's getting any better or not. And the other thing is uh, the other thing is um, um, what's the word I'm looking? For? 
contestant television, which I got to be honest with you, I, I watch. I, I watch it and I enjoy it, the X Factor and, you know, where there's talent involved, where somebody gets up on a stage and sings, whether they sing, you know, a cappella or they sing with music or they sing with a partner or something like that. They're showing their talent. And I don't mind a show like that. But, you know, putting nine people in a house that hate each other and, you know, with little, what's her name, Sniffy? What's the girl's name that's Snooky? And, you know, come on. It, this, it, it's not, it's not entertaining. Of course. Because the Muppets took talent to put together. Jim, Jim Henson had a vision when he put this together. And look, we've, been, we've all been watching uh, the Muppets now for what, 35 years, 40 years. I mean... Yeah. It is. Well, it's the, it's the great, uh, yeah, it's the great achiever. Probably not, because I have two left feet. There's not a worse there's not a worse dancer in the world than me. But I would be flattered if somebody asked me. But uh, no, I don't. I don't think that would. No, you wouldn't get me out there. No, that's that's why I watch it because those kids really. I think they have they have a lot of um, chutzpah, something. You know, hi. Okay, well, there's a story that goes with that. Her question was, how was the teamwork involved with me and others on the set of Stargate? And okay, well, if you've all if you've all seen the movie Stargate, the original movie by Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich. Okay, well, that character Charlie Kowalski actually existed, and it was played by uh, John Deal, who who was on Miami Vice, and John was on Miami Vice for however many years Miami Vice ran for, and and they, they said to him they wanted him to come back and play this role and, and re-up his role on television. And he said, well, I just got off a television series. I'm not very interested in doing another television series. And they said, well, what if we were to write you in for the pilot and then like kill you off very soon thereafter? And he said, yeah, you know, I'd be interested in that. Okay, yeah, you know, if it would just be like a one, two shot deal kind of thing, I would, I would be interested. So they wrote it that way. And when they're creating a new series, you have to write something, you have to get it approved by the network, and then you have to have storylines, uh, storyline ideas for, for different episodes coming up, maybe 12, 13 episodes coming up. And then you have to get those storylines, not necessarily scripts, but storylines approved by the network. So now here they sit, they have a green light to go, they have a full script for the pilot, they have a director hired, they have approval for 13 episodes coming up, and the approval was that that character dies in the first episode. And now they go back to John Deal, and John Deal says, I don't want to do it. I really don't want to do it. So, yeah, no, it was great for me, so I went in and, and, and then, the, 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 of course, the part became available, and I went in and read for it and got the role. But then, you know, I, I said to, you know, the executive producers of the show, you know, I wouldn't mind doing a series. You know, I haven't been on a series in like six years at that point, five years, something. And, and I said, I would love to do it. And they said, yeah, but we already have approval on all of these things, and so it would take us going back to the network and getting you part Making you part of the fire team and a series regular would entail a lot. And I said, oh, okay, all right, well, then let's just play it out. So that's what happened. And then I went in and I died in the first episode after the pilot, and then they brought me back a few times later. But I don't think the episodes were ever as good as that. The, my writing was never as good as the, the, the pilot in the first episode. But I had fun going back. It was a job. It was fun. You know? And I always enjoyed working with, the, with the Rick and... And Chris, Chris is so funny. Uh, Chris and Michael and Amanda, they're all great people. Yeah. Okay, tell us the Chris story. Uh, later. <laughs> it, I'm sure it entails a, a bottle of alcohol in a strip club, but I'm not sure. Yes, go ahead.
Um, I, 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 you mean on Stargate? Yeah, I, well, I, I, I watched the movie. Dean is a friend of mine. Dean Devlin is a friend of mine. He lived up the hill. When I lived in the Hollywood Hills, he lived up the hill from me for years. And so, uh, and, and he and I knew each other from New York. And uh, in fact, when I, I did the movie Cruising with Al Pacino, Dean Devlin worked for Al Pacino. He was his driver. He was his chauffeur. So we all kind of came up in the business together. And, and uh, so, yes, I did watch the movie uh, Stargate. Whether I was um, influenced by it at all, I don't know. I think I just kind of made it my own. I just did what I could. Uh, John Deal is a wonderful actor, and he did a great job. But I like to, I like to put my own signature on things and make things my own. I, th I think that's the only way. Uh, if, you, if you're going to get noticed, if you want to, you know, if you want to be, if you want to be special, I think you have to be original. Because if, if, you, if not, then you're just kind of copying. And uh, I don't know whether how many of you are. Um, two and a half men fans, but I, I see Ashton Kutcher really has his hands full trying to, uh, um, and, you know, he took over for Charlie Sheen, and, and Charlie really was doing a nice job on the show. Regardless of his personal life, he was doing, he was doing a wonderful job on the show, and now uh, Ashton Kutcher has a, a completely different role, but kind of taking the place of Charlie, and it's, it, I think it's difficult on him. He's having a, he's having a hard time uh, being accepted, and, uh, and so I just, I, you just try to make things your own. That's it, you know. Hey. What, uh, what style of acting like that? I mean, as far as the uh, genre, the uh, drama, comedy. What's your favorite style? Uh, favorite part of the I like it all. I, I think I I like it all, but I, I I enjoy doing drama the best. I when when drama is written properly, and there are good surprises and twists and turns in it, I really enjoy drama the best. Performing it. But I like it all, and I like watching it all, and I like performing it all. Uh, comedy, comedy's a lot, a lot of fun, but if the writing's not good in comedy, it's very, very difficult to rise above the material and, and you know, as they say, make it better. It, you know, it, there's an old saying, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage, and, and that's, uh, it's really true. And that, that goes for comedy, drama, sci-fi, whatever it is. If it's, if it's not written properly, it's never gonna be um, and, I, and I think we've all been witnesses to those kind of movies and television shows where you see a bunch of really talented actors trying to rise above the material and you just go, oh, these people are working really, really hard right now just trying to make this better and it's not getting any better. It's, <laughs> it's, it's only getting worse kind of thing. And I think we've all witnessed that once or twice. Talk a little bit about working in Vancouver. Is there kind of a competition between it and Hollywood, New York? And all that? Well, I think there was once. The question was, can I talk about working in Vancouver and is there a competition between the, uh, maybe the, the way the sets run? And, and Well, in the early days, yes, because they didn't have unions up there. They weren't established properly in, in Vancouver, I mean. And, um, and they were competing against guys who had been making movies for you know, since Jack Warner. I mean, these, these guys have been uh, fathered and grandfathered into their positions, whether they were teamsters or they were camera operators or camera uh, focus pullers or, or sound people or whatever. These guys were all fathered and grandfathered and uncled and nephewed into the business, and they've been doing it all their lives. And now these guys up in Vancouver are trying to play catch up. So I think in the very beginning, yes, I think you have a point that uh, maybe that the crews up there were not as good. They were not as savvy at, you know, we, we talk about uh, on the day, you gotta make something happen right now. We need a wall over here and you know, you MacGyver something up and you make it happen. And these guys would be, wow, we don't have a wall for that. We're down in California and these guys say, yeah, we, we, got a, yeah, we got a flat in the back, we'll take it out here and paint it and they'll be ready in 12 minutes, you know. And they can do that. And, uh, but now, it's a totally different story. Now, the guys up there are completely on an even keel with the guys in California. Um, they're really good crews, they're really efficient, they know what they're doing, they, they have all the materials they need, and they certainly have the, the brain power up there to, to make everything happen. They're good, they're really good. Anybody else? Hey. Yes. Uh, you worked, did you ever work with George Martin? Uh, 
Uh, is he, I know he's a writer on the show. Well, yeah, okay, George M.M. Uh, Martin, is that what he calls uh, himself? George, yeah. George, George, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I know George. Uh, he's a great guy and a very talented writer. And uh, yes, I think I, I when, when, now when you say I worked with him, or, or did I work with him, I mean, I was never in the writing room. Uh, very few of us actors ever got to see the inside of a writing room. They don't like us there. It's like, get out. Get out of here now. Um, but I know George, and he's a very talented guy, and not, he's, he's got something big going on right now, doesn't he? Well, so my follow-up would be, would you consider a Disney front part of Game of Thrones? In the Game of Thrones series. Game of Thrones, is that, is that his show? That's his show. Yes, I would. And in fact, that's the phone call I'm gonna make when I get out of here. I'm calling George Martin, saying, yeah. George, what's up, man? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank, you know what? Thanks for the reminder on that. And yes, I will call George Martin and ask him for a job. I, I'm, not a, I'm not above or below doing that. I, you know, I'll beg and grovel. I'm good with that. I'm fine. You know, I've called Perlman already and say, hey, what about this, you know, Sons of Anarchy thing? What's going on? I ride motorcycles. Let's go. You know. Right. So, when you were working on it, did you ever spend any time? No, we well we spent oh we spent time together every day. We spent time together all the time, but but we never actually got seen together on camera. Right, I knew that. Now the only one I ever worked with from down below was Roy Dutrice, that the played father. I never got to meet Ron, and I never wanted to meet Ron because if you meet Ron, you end up dead, and I never wanted to end up dead. I wanted I wanted to keep my job, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of a running joke. Coslow used to say to me, you want to make the beast? <laughs> and go over there and shut up and sit down. You know, it was Because it seemed like any human that met the beast died. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, have you ever considered doing voice acting? Say it again, please. Have you ever considered doing voice acting or done any voice acting? I, I have done a little bit of voiceover work. Um, the last thing I did, it was a while back, it, there used to be these things on television called the, the E! True Hollywood Story of blah, blah, blah. And I voiced over a two-hour episode called the E! True Hollywood Story of David Chase and the Sopranos, which is like perfect for me, you know. Yeah, and then Vinnie Boom Bots came out, you know, it was, it's, it's all of that kind of thing. So I had a good time doing it, and I did it for the E! Channel, and it was good. Uh, but. Uh, but I have friends that are into like cartoons and they do cartoon characters and all of that. I, that would be great. But no, I've never, I don't even know how to do it. And most of the people that do it now do it from their home because they're on, you know, iMac 3M something, I don't know what the hell it is. It's, it's all electronic stuff and they do it from their home. Yeah, they got, exactly. And I don't know how to do any of it. So, and, but I know people that do it and they have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, a friend of mine does, um, some rooster. He plays a rooster on a and, and a rat. Also, there's a there, uh, there's a family of rats and a family of roosters, and he plays one of each. And uh, he does good. He, he makes a nice living doing that. So, hey, how are you, man? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Hi. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I am the worst writer in all the land. There, there's not a worse, there, there's not a, there's not a, anybody worse than me at writing. I, I, I would consider directing. I, I like playing with actors and, uh, well, let me rephrase that. I like, I like, uh, <laughs> I, I, no, I, I like uh, 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 directing actors. I, I've done it in classrooms and stuff like that. I've done it for stage work, just little things, uh, directing scenes and stuff like that. Uh, but I've never put it on film or video, so I, I would consider that. That sounds fun, you know. I'd like that. Hi. You mentioned doing Mr. Roberts as the first one that kind of got you involved in it. Uh, two questions associated that. Do you remember what part you played? You yeah, played I played Kowalski. I played Kowalski, yes. I, 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 played, I, I understudied Kowalski and went on with it once. Because the fellow who did it, the fellow who actually did the part, broke his leg. So somebody had to replace him for a couple of days, and that was me. 
And then I also played, uh, the, my, my part that I got cast in was a little kind of walk-on. Remember that all the sailors uh, steal the captain's goat? Yes. Okay, well, we used a live goat on stage every night, and he used to poo all over the stage. And I was the shore patrolman who came and got the goat back from the drunk sailors. And so, and the, you know, and the goat would go absolutely insane every night. So it was a big laugh. And, and I think that was part of uh, uh, me kind of falling in love with stage work and, and uh, liking it so much because you never knew what, I never knew what was going to happen with this goat. And it was uh, fun. Yeah. Okay. Yes. One follow-up question. Have you ever done any other stage acting? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I did, I did uh, oh, probably, I don't know, I did five or six plays while I was in New York, and then I did like three plays while I, when I lived in Los Angeles. So, you know, nothing of any great note. You know, I, I, I wish I could tell you, you know. I'm not one. Some of these guys out here that you guys have here, you know, as guests, it's you know, yeah, I have an album coming out next month and seven movies. I, I, I just don't, I don't have that kind of life. I, I just, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I did, uh, let me see. The last play I did was a play called Crooks, and we did it at the Tiffany Theater on Sunset Strip in Los Angeles, and I had a great time. And uh, I developed a great friendship from that play, a guy named Michael Wiseman, who I hang out with to this day. In fact, he moved out of town. He slept at my house last night in Los Angeles, so because he moved out of town, he moved up to uh, San Francisco, so he still comes in for auditions and things, and he spent the night at my house last night, so. I did two different soaps. I did, a, I did a soap called As the World Turns for two years, and then I did a soap called uh, uh, Search for Tomorrow for two years. And I think both of them are off the air now. In fact, I know they are. Yeah. So uh, it's a great training ground for an actor. And, and uh, you know, it's earn while you learn. You're earning a decent living. Plus, you're learning how to work with um, all different types and styles of acting, of actors. And if you don't learn what to do, you certainly learn what never to do. Uh, no, I know, really, because, uh, you know, we've all, in whatever our jobs are, uh, you know, you, you, you learn from people as you go along, as you're coming up the ladder. And, uh, how do I say this and be nice? There are people that just don't know what they're doing. And, and then there are people that you really watch and, and you know, one people, one person, one people, one, one person that was very influential to me when I was uh, coming up in the business was the woman that played my mother on, on Search for Tomorrow. Her name is Marie Cheatham, and uh, I will, I will uh, uh, never forgive her for uh, making me fall in love with this crazy thing called acting because she's the one that kind of uh, showed me a lot of things, what to do, what never to do, and, uh, and uh, I remember she yelled at me one time really bad. Wow. Because I was young and cocky and... I kept her waiting once, and you know, she, she, no, this is a woman who had been around for a while, she's not much older than me, I'm like, you know, I'm 57 now, Maria's probably like 63 or 4, she's a, a lovely, lovely lady, well, and she had been on a soap since she was a kid, and I kept her waiting one day for like 15 minutes, and boy, she pulled me aside and just absolutely let me have it, nobody keeps me waiting, ever, that'll never happen again, and I said, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, it was that kind of thing where she saw that I really needed to be yelled at and she yelled at me and, and she straightened everything out. So, and then I, I learned a lot from her just watching her perform and, and other people as well. So it was, uh, it was, it was great training. Uh, it, it teach you how to hit your marks and say your lines and get the words out and get the hell off the stage. <laughs> The question was, do you think there's much of a future for soaps? And You mean for me or you mean for soaps in general? Well, I don't think there's any future for me in soaps. Uh, but but uh, and, and is there a future for soap operas to come back or, or daytime television to come back? Not in that capacity. I think people like, you know, the likes of Procter & Gamble and that, they just don't want to shell out their, that kind of money anymore because I don't think they're making that kind of money anymore. And maybe I'm being naive when I say that. I don't know. You know, I know they sell a lot of soap, but... There you go. And it used to be that, you know, when we grew up, our moms were always home. 
Now moms are out, you know, moms drop the kids off at school, they go to work, dad goes to work, the house is empty, the place gets robbed. You know, that's the way it is now. That's the way it's pretty much, that, that's it now. It's not, you know, where mom is Mrs. Cleaver and stays home all day waiting for the kids to get off the bus. It's just not that way, you know. So many people over the years, it would be hard, but certainly Al Pacino was a big, uh, I mean, Al Pacino was one of my favorite actors growing up. I mean, he's one of my influences for getting in the business. Um, yeah, my influences getting into the business are Jackie Gleason, not necessarily in this order, but Jackie Gleason, the Three Stooges, and Al Pacino. Th those are the people that I just admire the most, you know. And so when I got to work with him, I remember being in the Baldwin Place Shopping Center in the movie theater, or the bunker at the end of the mall, as we called it, um, and watching a movie called Dog Day Afternoon. This is in like 1973. And I didn't even know who the guy was that I was watching on the screen, because I was too young, really, to, oh, that's an actor. Yeah, what's his name? Who cares? He, this is a really good movie. And I remember sitting there with my friend Rick Leonard, who later became a police officer. He became a narcotics officer in Dade County, Florida. And we're like, I don't know how old we are. In 1973, I was born in 55, so how old was I? Uh, I was 15. 18, 18, I'm 18 years old, we're sitting there and, you know, and, and, and the credits are starting to roll and, and I, I lean over to Rick and I say, you know what, I think I could do this. And he said, what, Rob Banks? I said, no, no, I think I could do what this guy is doing up on the screen. I think this is really cool. I'm going to sit and watch this movie again. So I did, you know, and then, like, that was in 73 and in 1979 I worked with this guy. That's America. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's, I, yeah, that's one of those things. Uh, but, you know, there's so many people who I've worked with and met over the years. I've really had a fortunate career where I got to, you know, I wasn't stuck on one series. I got to work on many, many um, uh, different peoples and come in as a guest. And, uh, and you, you get to meet a lot of people. And it was, uh, it's, I'm trying to think of somebody like really cool that would like make you go, wow, you worked with him? Um, but I can't think of one right now. But, but yeah, but I, I've worked with, we, we were talking the other day when I was in Nashville, and Toby Keith came on the radio, and I and I said to I said to my buddy Mike, I said I worked with him with Toby Keith. He says you did. I said yeah, I did an episode of I did a two hour movie for The Dukes of Hazard, and he was in it. I know, I, I know, I know. And uh, he was scared to death because he never acted before. He never acted in his life, and at that time he wasn't a real, real big star like he is now. But he was certainly an up and coming star, and and he was getting to be a household name. He was a great guy. He was a great guy. I said, hey man, I, you know, I, I remember walking up to him and saying, hey man, I really like your music. He goes, God, he's pacing back and forth. He said, I don't know how you guys do this. He said, I'm sick to my stomach. <laughs> I said, no, no, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. It's going to be all right. I said, look, I'd never get up on a stage and sing to people. I just wouldn't do it. He said, man, I wish they would just let me sing and get out of here. He said, I don't want to do all this, you know, looking at people in the face and saying stuff on the screen. I, I don't want to do that. I said, well, just think about it like being, almost like being interviewed. He goes, yeah, I tried that already. That, that doesn't work. <laughs> and he's got a great sense of humor. He's a good guy. But now he can say, hey, one of the best people I've worked with is Jay Appleton. There you go. Yeah, we're doing that for you. Yeah, yeah. Hi. You said uh, three students were big influence. Have you seen uh, the trailer for the new movie? And what do you think about it? I have not seen the trailer for the new movie. Who's, who, tell me who's in it. I don't even know who's in it. And they have all new actors playing the roles. He said, I wonder, I, I wonder, because you know who was a big, big Three Stooges fan? Um, uh, Bruce Willis was a huge Three Stooges fan. And um, John Goodman. John Goodman from, uh, from um, Roseanne. One of the guys that was on William Shatner's short best show, stuff my dad said. Yes. One of the brothers on there is playing Curly. Oh, great. And he does. Does he do a good job? <laughs> yeah. I definitely will. Okay, I will. I will. Hi. Hi. Um, can you tell us maybe about what it was like working on the Invisible Man and then just kind of like the Invisible? What it was like to work on the Invisible Man? 
There's another show I forgot I did. Yes, no, I did. Um, okay, yes, I remember I shot it in San Diego, and I had a great time. I'm trying to think. I'm just trying to put this all together for myself. It was a long time ago. It was 50, 17 years ago, probably. Um, really? Was it good? Oh, good. Um, yeah, no, I, I, always, I always had a good time. I always had a good time. I, um, I can't. I can't. I have. I have absolutely no. Uh, I, I, I. And I wasn't even drinking back then or anything. I was absolutely. I was. I was in the middle of my sobriety. So there's no reason in the world why I can't uh, remember that. Other than I had too much to drink last night. Uh, but. But. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Say it again. Right to get him to to get him to come to uh, where we could see them, visible. That's the word I was looking for. Big word, bigger than delicatessen. I, I don't know anything bigger than that at, at this hour. Um, yeah, no, I, I, it's coming back to me. But uh, I don't. Even, who, who are the other players in the show? One of the funniest guys in the whole wide world. Paul Ben Victor is so funny and so good. What a great actor. Yep. Wow. I think I did, I did two or three episodes. I did two, two, okay, yeah. It was a two-parter. It was, you're right, it was a two-parter. Yes, it's coming to me now. We shot it in Del Mar and San Diego, and I, yeah, I had a really, really good time. It was really good. And, uh, and I, rem I remember I was very self-conscious doing it. I remember that. I was very, very self-conscious doing that. And, and for a very personal reason, I was really, really overweight when I did that. Because uh, I, I was, I was, I was out of my mind eating and drinking and, uh, and you know, uh, drinking, you know, Coca-Cola by the gallon and I put on a lot of weight and, and I'd gotten very self-conscious about my weight. And I remember I was like probably 15 pounds overweight when I shot the whole thing. Look, my balls are ringing. Hang on one second. I just want to say. I got to turn this off. I'm sorry. They'll just call back if I don't. I didn't need that phone anyway. <laughs> the Invisible Man. Wow. That was a long time ago. You're reminding me how old I am. I, 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 well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still doing the construction. I'm going to go back to it uh, on Tuesday. I'm going to take the day off on Monday. Do laundry. Uh, and then uh, I'll go back to construction. And then, you know, my agent knows I'm back in town. So, I, And I really want to get going. I really want to keep doing this. I, I, I really enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I hadn't done it. Like I said, I hadn't done it in a while. Uh, I hadn't done it about, I guess the last thing I did, uh, Bob Zemeckis called me up. Uh, he's a director that I'd worked for for probably three times over the years. I did an episode called Yellow of um, Tales from the Crypt uh, years ago with Kirk, with Kirk Douglas and his son, Eric. The other son, not Michael, but the other son, the boy who died. And I did an episode called Yellow, uh, and I worked with Bob on that, and I worked with him on Cast Away. And then he called me up, and Bob became very um, wanting to make this movie uh, about uh, the high wire walker, the French high wire walker, Philippe Petit. And uh, he had seen this documentary that was made about him. Well, he wanted to make the uh, a full-length feature film about this guy's life, but he didn't want to do it in live action. He wanted to do it in motion capture. And I guess when the studio heard that, they said, you know, Bob, you know, before we separate with like $100 million, we'd like to see what you're going to make. So he was basically forced into making a presentation film for the studio so they could see basically what idea he had in his head. So he called me up and like seven other actors, and we uh, got out on the motion, uh, motion capture volume. That's what they call it, like the square. And, and you go out there and you're dressed in this kind of baloney skin with white dots all over you. And, uh, and we played all different characters. I played a cop and a, um, a, a guy who, uh, a, at the loading zone. Because the whole thing was about how Philippe Petit got upstairs in the Twin Towers and was able to pull this off and walk between the towers back in the 70s. And that's what basically the whole little story was about. So that was the last time I had worked. And that was probably two and a half years ago. And then I did um, How I Met Your Mother about maybe two and a half months ago. And I gotta tell you, I only had a little tiny part. I had probably had five, three, three lines. I was scared to death. 
You know, because, you know, you get the nerves working and everything. All of a sudden, your voice goes like this. You know, you know yeah, everything's going great. And, oh, no, I'm ready. Let's go. Where's the coffee? You know, and all of a sudden, they say, okay, Jay, we're ready for you next. And you're like, okay, I'll be right there. Don't worry about it. We're going to do this. Everything will be fine. Oh, Jesus. You know, and, but I did. I had a good time. And, and, uh, and I got through it. I got through it. And, uh. And, uh, you know, uh, the only thing that Howard told me, Howard was my acting coach, Howard Fine, and, you know, Howard just told me, as he always tells me, do the audition, leave it in the room, leave it, in other words, leave it on the camera, do, do on the day what you do in the rearview mirror uh, on the way home in the car, you know? So it's almost like going to a job interview where you're, you know, you're on your way home from the job interview and the guy said, you know, this is what I should have said, you know, and then you're, you're never, you're never, you know what I mean? And, and that's how it's there. Always leave it in the room. You leave them everything. But it's, it's hard when you talk like this, you know, I can't feel my feet. Why? Nerves. You know, it's that. So, hi. Yeah, no, I, of course I need glass. I can't even see your hands. Uh, yeah, no, I, okay. So, oh, right on. Sean Hayes, and, and who's the other guy? Okay. Now, I know uh, uh, Sean Hayes. I know who that is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but I will, I will look it up, because I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of, of Three Stooges. I like them guys. I like them guys. Hi, go ahead. I can't read. Have you ever thought about getting with someone to write a memoir? Just a uh, funny anecdotes that you've had over the years? Or I, haven't, I don't think I've lived enough. I don't think I've lived enough yet. But someday, you know, I, I like telling stories and I like, you know, even, even goofy stories about, not, not even so much about acting, but about, you know, about being married and my, <laughs> about my ex-wife and just stuff. Because I find it interesting. I told a story when I was in Nashville recently about teaching Teach, and I've actually told this story here, teaching my ex-wife how to drive a car. Oh my God. Oh my God. No wonder people hire drivers and people hire like teachers to teach your loved ones how to drive. Because you could kill someone. And my wife almost did. My ex-wife almost did kill me. A few times. <laughs> Jesus. We're born, we used to live on this steep hill. We used to live on this steep hill called Camino Palmera in the middle of Hollywood. Just north of Hollywood Boulevard. And she never drove a car. She was 40 years old. When we moved to Los Angeles, she was 40 years old. We lived in New York all our lives, you know. So there was no reason to have a car. And when we did need a car, I rented one and we drove out of town. And she never drove. So it got to, we got to Los Angeles and I got my first bill for her car, for her car service. And the, the first bill was like $1,400 for the month for her car. Yeah, because every time she needed a glass of milk, she went to... She ordered a limousine. Like, okay, this is kind of stop. This is like insane. So anyway, I bought a little car for her. I bought a little Honda, whatever it was, a little used car. And I figured, well, she's going to smash it up. Everybody smashes up their first car. Everybody does. So I bought her a little Honda. And I tried to explain to her, it's just, it's common sense. You know, you drive down the street, you always stay on the right side of the, right side of the street. Right side. We're not in England. You stay on the right side of the street. And when you get to the stop sign, you stop, you look both ways, and you carry on. Well, we get down the bottom of the cell. I said, okay, honey, the stop sign coming up, stop sign coming up. Okay, okay, stop sign. And she's slowing down. Okay, I feel better. Slowing down. And stop. Okay, she stops. Now, she looks at me like this. She's behind the wheel. She looks at me, and she goes, okay? And I go, yeah, yeah. And she just pulls out. She doesn't look. She doesn't look. And there's like a cement truck coming. And he's like, and he's, you know, with the horn and the skid marks and the thing. <laughs> and I said, oh, Jesus, God, now she's looking down and she knows she's done something. This isn't supposed to happen. I go, yeah, no shit. So now she's got the shifter and she's moving it back. I said, what are you looking for? And she goes, gee, I'm looking for G. And I said, gee, what the? And she says, go back. I, I need to go back. So that. So anyway, it's stories like that, you see, that... <laughs> so it, it's, 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 not all, it's not all about... Uh, 
acting stuff with his. Yeah, there you go. It's one of the reasons she's my ex-wife. No, we actually get along pretty good. She's a she's a good girl. She's remarried now and pretty happy and and she and she drives. Amazingly, she does drive. And I I I hired a guy immediately. That's I said, I'll drive back to the house and I hired some guy, a Spanish guy came over to the house and he spoke English and Spanish and he was a wonderful man and I said, You teach her. You take her, you teach her, I don't want to know, send me the bill. I don't want to know nothing about it. And it did. It was like magic. Thank you. So, uh, anybody else? Question something? I do, I live in Cali. I live in uh, Studio City, California. Uh, I've been through a few earthquakes, they're fun. For me it is because, you know, I fish and I, I ride motocross, so it, for me to be out in the desert on my motorcycle just about any time of year, it's, it's worth it to me. And, uh, you know, there are other places, in fact, we've been discussing that. My girlfriend and I have been discussing that if, because California is getting so ridiculously expensive to live in, that we, we've been discussing that recently, that if we didn't live in the state of California, what other state in the union would we like to live in? And I, I don't know the answer to that. It ain't gonna be Indiana, it's too cold here. I can tell you, as much as I love you all, I'm not living in this. I just, I can't do it. Well, I'll give you an idea. I mean, my, it, my, uh, my, my mom left me and my sister a house. I gave it to my sister, it's in New York State. I gave it to my sister, I said, you take it. She goes, what do you mean? I said, take it, I'm never going back there. I can't take that winter, I just, there's no way. I can't do it, no. No, I want my feet in white sand, drink in my hand, palm tree over my head. Hey, hey, no. you know, that's that's pretty much my speed now. I like Hawaii. Hawaii is nice. But I don't want to live there. You can't. You get island fever, you know. If you, you spend too much time on the island, you know. <laughs> Texas? How is it down there? Yeah. Be a, that's, that's consideration. We actually mentioned Texas. Yeah, and uh, New Mexico is not, you know, there's some kind of artsy fartsy places in New Mexico, like uh, uh, now the other one, Albuquer Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Oh, you know, the, I got a story about that white sand. I was driving through New Mexico. I had my motorcycle in the back, in the back of the truck, and I saw the white sand there. I thought. So I put my motocross equipment on, I get all, and I, I go up in the white sand. And I'm doing wheelies and I'm riding for like two or three miles. All of a sudden, a helicopter, a black helicopter, hovers like 15 feet off the deck and he's right over my head. And, go back to your truck. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what did I do? So I get back to the truck and there's, I'm not kidding you, there's like seven black government cars waiting for me. And I, I'm up on like this little hillside and I'm looking down and I said, man, this can't be good. <laughs> I'm not a real smart guy, but this ain't good, I can tell you that. And uh, <laughs> I get back there and he says, he, he looks at me, he says, take the helmet off. So I said, so I took the helmet off and he says, uh, there's a full colonel down here, I'd like to have a word with you. And I go, oh, is he, is he here? <laughs> he says, pack up the motorcycle and keep moving. He said, that's government land. It's protected. It's whatever it is. It's uh, top secret stuff. And I go, I, who knew? I didn't know that. He goes, you didn't know that was protected land. And I said, no, I just saw the white sand. I thought it would be really cool to ride in it. He said, yeah, go on, beat it. <laughs> and so I always manage to get myself in trouble. It doesn't matter what I, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Who knew there would be a black helicopter out there? <laughs> Question? Anybody? Oh, I don't know. It, it's probably one of those Area 51 things, but I was just driving through. I didn't know. It's not, you know, there wasn't any special sign or anything. I just saw all this beautiful white sand, and I thought, yeah, I could, you know, get it up on one wheel and ride it for a while out there, and it'd be nice. You know, it'd be a lot of fun, because it's like white powder. It's almost like talcum powder. It's sweet. 
They didn't take to it very well. Hi. Uh, your role in Independence Day, was yes. it supposed to be longer than it was in the movie? It was it supposed to be longer? Yeah. Well, if it was up to me, I would have had Will Smith's role. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, no, no, I think that was it. That was really it. I mean, uh, Dean, Dean put me in there I, I, because I had been in touch with Dean Devlin. I said, look, if there's anything I can do in this movie, because the buzz was it was going to be a great big movie. And, uh, you know, he had already made Stargate, I believe, and he would already made Universal Soldier, and he'd made a couple of films, and they were, he, he, was, he was really getting good at it. He was getting good at writing, Roland was getting very good at directing, and I said, if there's anything in this movie, Dean, you know, I'd be willing to come out and do it with you. And he goes, well, there might be something, there might be something uh, on the Bonneville Salt Flats, maybe. And I said, all right. And the next thing I know, he's calling my house, and he says, hey, man. I got you something. You want to fly out and do it? I said, yeah, sure. So, that, and that was it. So it was, uh, yeah, it was fun. I had, I, had a, I had a fun time. But, you know, I had no idea there was going to be all of that. You know, when you read something on paper and you actually see it, it might be two different things. You know, because they said, it, it just said RVs. RVs come in, uh, and they didn't say, you know, by the bushel or anything like that. It just said RVs. And I thought there'd be, you know, five, six RVs. They were like... 350 RVs. And when we um, uh, rehearsed this, it was just Will and I, and, and Roland was standing here, and Dean, and we rehearsed it back and forth, just me and Will Smith, and Dean and Roland. And he said, okay, let's walk over to the guard shack. We're gonna shoot this. I said, okay, there's the guard shack. And way out in the distance. You can I mean, it was just a little bit of a cloud that you could see there was a lot of stuff out there, whatever it was. But I thought it was like another movie set, another, and it was like, okay, let's get the RVs lined up and let's, and I thought, oh my God, all of those RVs are coming now. Now I can't make a mistake. If I make a mistake, all of those RVs have to turn around, right? So now the president, there goes the voice again. Oh my God. Because, <laughs> you know, you think there's no pressure and all of a sudden 350 people have to turn around because you screw up. I, Say, time's up? Okay. I've had a great time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.